Well, nothing's going to happen today. <laughs> Another easy day. Another easy day. <laughs> well, for it's, me at least. It's, yeah, for well, for both of us too. Because I mean, I, you can see this in the camera, I'm sure. I've got a very uh, large elbow and normally have very large elbows, he's unfortunately. Happy. He's just happy to see that. <laughs> you. Um, and I have bursitis in my elbows and that's what's causing the, the lumps that you see on them. But this one has also got gout in it now which is very painful to try to do any kind of uh, work. So we're gonna kind of hold off on the work for a little while till we can get this thing worked out and then we'll start back on our tech stuff here pretty soon. But today, I wanna go over something that is an interesting thought process. I saw a post on Facebook the other day in one of the groups that I follow talking about rack versus stock steering. And mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting thing because there was a lot of comments on it. I mean, it was like, 50, 75 comments of people putting their own opinions in about whether you should do a rack or not do a rack. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're going to be talking about right now is exactly that, whether you should do a rack and pinion and what that means. Yeah, because there's a lot of that actually goes into it. There's a lot more that goes into it than a lot of people don't realize and things that are, that are problematic for doing a rack, like if you own a Chevrolet or a Ford that's a column shift, mm -hmm. bye -bye. <laughs> you're going to lose your column shift right away and in some applications that's not a bad thing like yeah. i mean a camaro with a column shift has always seemed a little weird to me and it did happen mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't look right it, in some cars it doesn't look right like 69 fairlane wagon that we have mm -hmm. a floor shift on a wagon that looks wrong it looks wrong it <laughs> just doesn't. in a fairlane unless it's like a four speed in the middle of the floor then yeah if you've got a t-handle or a stock forward four speed shifter sticking out of the floor with the correct hump there that looks okay, but but to not have that, yeah, it just looks funny to have an automatic shifter in the floor. Anyway, I digress on that. That's the bigger problem than that. But what I wanted to start off with is um, stock steering and what you can do to improve that if that's what you want to do. And the first thing I want to talk about though is what is your 90%? Mm -hmm. Like normal. <laughs> yeah, like normal. I mean, this is what we, yeah. we pound this a lot, but that is a very important factor is what is your 90% yeah. on your car? What are you actually doing with it? Right. I mean, if you're doing street driving on your car 90% of the times and you're only going to the occasional drag race or you're going to the occasional you know, open track event. Rack and pinion, not super necessary. Probably not going to be your best friend. Yeah. No. Nah. <laughs> and you're going to spend a lot of money doing it. I mean, it's not a cheap process. So if you know what your 90% is and you say, look, I don't really give a crap about all that. My daily driver is a Porsche 911. Yeah. You don't really need... You don't need it, but you're probably going to want that rack yeah. because you're used to precision, so you want that precision in your classic car. Yeah. What are you really looking to get out of the car? The exactly, end? but if you're like a lot of guys, like I know my friend Rick Schmidt, he likes the feel of a classic car. He mm -hmm. likes the feel of the car as it was back in the day, what you would have bought on day one yeah, or you, close to if it. If you put a rack and pinion on anything back from back then, you're not going to get any reaction like that. No, it's going to be a completely different yeah. feel, and your feel is going to be more precise. You're going to have to pay more attention to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's gonna be your problem with it, is it's not gonna feel like it did back in the day. And that's a mindset issue too. Mm -hmm. I run into that, where you get into a classic car and you have a car with a rack and pinion that's a 66 Mustang or whatever, and you're driving it down the road and you're expecting to have that little play in the steering wheel mm -hmm. and you do the typical boat captain stuff yep. like you do, <laughs> Just take and the car's from... doing this going down the road, yep because of that rack is so precise. Or you just stop and look at something else, the little tilt of your shoulder and with your head. And suddenly you're in the oncoming you're, traffic. Yeah. <laughs> you're making an unexpected lane change. <laughs> so there's, there's the caveats within all that, what your 90% is on the car, and boiling that down to within that 90%, what are you gonna do on a daily basis? What do you really like to see from yeah. your classic car? All right, so what I'm gonna talk about now is stock steering systems. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, the Camaro and Chevelle guys got it all over the Ford guys because Chevrolet initially was smart enough to run a Saginaw steering box, and there is a ton of aftermarket support mm -hmm. for that box. And you can get an integral box, which Ford didn't adopt for the Mustang and the Fairlane until 72 on the Torino and 71 on the Mustang. And they went, oddly enough, to the Saginaw box. It works. Because <laughs> it works. So that's something to keep in mind of. 
uh, on the Ford side of things, if you have an early Mustang, there's a couple of things you can do mm -hmm. if you want to stay away from power steering because that is probably the most hideous system for problems. Yeah, I, I can't stand the power stock power steering system on the. We put it on the on the wagon because we were putting the big tires on there, but mm -hmm. that created the other problem. We put the big tires on there, and that it created was... a problem with the steering. <laughs> yeah, it started ripping out the frame mount. <laughs> yeah, and I mean that's a big issue on these things mm -hmm. because you're basically using hydraulic power to help you turn the, the yeah. wheels on it. It's literally just a ram against the rod to the frame rail. Yeah, that's and, all it's doing. And if you do the nut search, trust <laughs> me, with big tires. It's they like come a, right out. <laughs> they come right out. We've even tried welding it to the frame rail, and that's been it cracked. <laughs> marginally successful. Yeah. Um, but so let's just take that out of the play because that's not going to be a performance aspect for what you might want to do. If you're doing a Mustang, the nice thing is you can get aftermarket boxes yeah. that are the 16 to 1 ratio, which is the fast ratio. Mm -hmm. I think it's 16 to 1, or it may be 14 to 1. Fast ratio box. I always go to what Shelby did. What would Shelby do? WWSD. <laughs> he knew how to build the cars. He, Miles, and those guys just worked those cars ad yep. nauseum. They figured out what worked on them and made them drive well enough to get around the track and win some races. And what they did was they went in with the fast ratio box, an extended idler arm, and I believe, and I'm not sure about this, but I believe they actually used a roller assembly in the idler arm, mm -hmm. which made it a little easier to handle going into the corners. That's wonderful. And it's going to work very well performance-wise, but it is also going to be a problem if you're in a parking lot with big tires on the car. Yes, a quick ratio box is going to be much harder to turn standing still. And and the big tires. I mean, that's yeah. really the biggest problem. Yeah. Is your tires are going to kick your butt because if you're running VR or Z, ZR speed rated tires. Yeah, any kind of compound that's stickier than the hard tire is not going to be fun to turn. Yeah, but if you're doing an, you know, an eight inch wide rim mm -hmm. compared to the stock tires, which are probably about that wide on a Mustang. Yeah, maybe five inches of contact patch. Yeah, you got a yeah. problem. But that would be my remedy for that, for a better steering system that feels more planted. Mm -hmm. Brand new components all the way across yes. on the steering system, inner and outer tie rod ends, drag link, everything brand new. Any ball joint is a point of movement. That's lost. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about that too. I mean, that's a problem with most stock steering systems is that they're crappy and nobody fixes them. Yeah, because nobody messes with them because they're crappy, so they just <laughs> leave them alone. But any, anything in there is a lost motion. And what you have going from the steering wheel, you have the shaft going into the box, going for a screw into a worm box, going out down to a pitman arm, going from the pitman arm to the idler or to, to the drag link, over to the idler arm, and then you have two tie rods, inner and outer, on mm -hmm. either side. All of that is a recipe for lost motion. Yep. And that just contributes to squirreliness and the whole captain's boat deal. <laughs> yeah. And so what you're going to end up doing is you're going to have to go in and just replace all that stuff with brand yep. new. I like Moog components. Moog still makes really good stuff. Even though a lot of it's being pulled in from China, they're still doing a lot of controls with it. Uh, so if you can, get Moog components for the car. And Open Tracker Racing has an idler arm that is a roller idler arm. If you don't do the extended one, because I don't think that that's necessarily the top of the line ideal. Yeah, for driving and just regular daily stuff, you don't need the extended. And with that, you get the roller, which will help with the steering on the front end. Even with those bigger tires, it's going to feel less like you're having to you know, strong yeah. arm the thing around the corner. Yeah, you're not having to fight the idle arm. Exactly. All the force is getting transmitted more into the tires. Exactly. And then you're not having to fight that, you know, the rubber pulling it back to what is quote unquote center on mm -hmm. the car. You may have less of it doing that, but if your caster is set yep. up correctly, you should be fine. Trust me. Just go with the roller idler arm. You'll be happy. Open Tracker Racer sells a ton of them. They work great. Um, the next thing I want to move on to is the Borgeson steering box system because that's the next step for a lot of guys mm -hmm. in the Ford market. If I were a GM guy, honestly, I would just find a good Saginaw box. They make boxes that are quick ratio. They have boxes that are for performance, mm -hmm. like for road racing and all that kind of stuff. You can go out there and find ad nauseum ways to make that system work better. For Ford guys, your next step up is a Borgeson box, but... It still has issues. <laughs> it's got its own set of issues, and I don't mean they're issues in a bad way. Yeah, it's just stuff that you lose compared to a stock system. Right. I mean, you, you've got a situation with a Borgeson box where you're going to not be able to run column shift. Yep. I know a lot of guys that's not necessarily a problem. And if I'm doing a, a Torino, you know, fast fact, Cobra, a floor shift doesn't look weird in there. But if I'm doing a Torino wagon, floor shift's weird. 
It just looks weird. And I'm pretty sorry. much any classic car, if you have to put a shifter in the middle of the floor that's not a stock shifter, it looks kind of weird. It looks kind of weird. And, you know, it's like Rick always says, it looks like socks on a chicken. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't look right. It doesn't look <laughs> you look right. at it and you just get confused. You look in a wagon, you want to see that column shifter there, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the come here, darling, bench seat. Yeah. That's what you're looking for. Um, but that's really the biggest drawback I see from the Borgeson Integral Box is that it's it's going to do away with your column shift mm -hmm. because the box mounts and then you have universal joints and then you cut the column off Flush right at the firewall. Yeah. And so you don't have anywhere for the shifter linkage for the column shift to operate. That's also going to be a problem with almost every rack and pinion out there too mm -hmm. because all of them make you cut the column shorter. You can't run, I don't know of a rack and pinion right now for the Ford market that runs with a, a stock column shift. Yeah, you can run a column shift with it. All right, so the vast majority of the racks that you see out there on the market right now are either one of two types. You have an, an end steer rack, which means that the inner tie rod ends mount directly to the end of the rack and pinion, mm -hmm. or you have a center steer rack, which has a mounting point in the center and either a tie rod bar or the rack inner tie rods mount directly to that center post position. Yep. That's it. Those are the ones that are the major rack and pinions that I was able to find for both the General Motors, Mopar, and Ford market. For all three of those guys, that's what's out there. Yeah. Um, and that's basically it. That's really all that differentiates all of them. <laughs> it really is. I mean, some of it's mounting positions yeah. too, because there's a couple of different mounting positions for the center steer racks, but I'll go into that in just a minute. But what I'm going to talk about now basically is the end steer rack first. Uh, in steer rack, your inner tie rod ends mount directly to the rack and pinion, so you have n less lost motion mm -hmm. in the rack and pinion. I think probably almost every rack and pinion out there running right now on new cars is an in steer rack. Yeah, majority of them are. I don't. And obviously, yeah, and obviously your your advantage in that is going to be the fact that there is less lost motion. Yep. You're going directly from the lower rack mount position to the inner tie rod ends, out to the outer tie rod ends, and you're done. Yep, it would have the most responsiveness and the most road feel as well. I, yes, so, I would think you'd have- Good yes. and bad. There is good and bad in that yep. too, and that goes back to what we were talking about before. If you're a lazy driver like I am- yep. If you just want to take a cruise, rack and pinion is not going to be that fun because you're going to have to be paying attention. You're not going to do a lot of this. No, <laughs> only once, and then you're going <laughs> to- Because gonna at some point seat. you're going to go, hey, look at that, and you're going to be in the ditch. Yes. Uh, and I'm not saying that those are bad situations, that's just what you're going to run into. Now, one of the cons I see for the in-steer rack systems is the fact that you are set by whatever car they're taking that rack and pinion from for your bump steer positions. Mm -hmm. um, they can mount that thing where they want to mount it, but you're not going to have a lot of play if you lower the car. Yeah. They have to go for a mean. Probably what I think they do with mean would be that they go with whatever the position for the tie rod ends was originally on the car, that's where we're gonna put the tie rods. Cause if they start trying to go mean as being, well, it's gonna be one inch lower, it's gonna be a one inch taller, they're gonna start running into a lot of yeah. problems with, with setup. You're gonna run into problems, however, aftermarket wise, when you put that thing in there, if they don't have alternate mounting positions mm -hmm. for a lowered car. Yeah, if you can't change the mount of the rack to make it higher or lower on the car center line. You're gonna have bump steer problems. Yes. And it'll be much more pronounced, I think, than a regular box. Now, one of the big problems I've seen with the mounting system on these is they mount in place of your engine cross member. Mm, which isn't horrible, but it's not the best place. It's actually, I don't mind the mounting position so much as how it's mounted because mm -hmm. Ford used a special bolt to put the engine cross member in those cars on the Mustangs. Mm -hmm. uh, the Falcon didn't have a cross member, so it's not as critical on that from uh, a mounting perspective. But how they mount that thing on the Mustang, the uh, the bolts were a swedged bolt. Mm -hmm. And I'm showing you a picture of the bolt right here. Um, this is what that bolt looks like. And it basically centers up that cross member on the underside of the car. And it keeps it solid where it's supposed to be set at. Most of the aftermarket racks that are available don't do that. They have a standard bolt system that bolts in place. Also a problem you can have is if you take the cross member off and the frame rails separate, it is an issue that you can worry about. I mean, that's something you need to think about when you're putting a rack in there. I would definitely stabilize the whole yeah. chassis in order to put the rack in so that you don't have to worry as much about that. Yeah, if your shock towers are any kind of questionable, <laughs> like my car. <laughs> your shock towers were not just a little They weren't existing. They were awful. <laughs> 
if we hadn't done all the things we did to him, I wouldn't even drive that bloody car. I mean, that thing was terrible. Yeah, it, it, was, it was very sketchy. <laughs> but the other thing I found with a lot of those mounting systems where they're using the cradle replacement is sometimes it can be really tough to get to the bolts mm -hmm. on um, lower control the arms. lower control arms. And you have to go in sometimes and cut back the flanging yep. on your lower control arm mounting brackets. Yep. Uh, and that can... I, it I it becomes a lot more problem 67 on up because that's where the uh, camber adjustment You adjust is. all your camber right there, so then I don't know what you're going to do. I know that there are some of them that probably have a hole there that you can get to that bolt, but I know that it's supposed to be far enough off there that you can get a wrench on there. Yep. But our experience was, was that it wasn't. <laughs> Very tight. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to be chassis. That's going to be whatever yep. car you're working on. Some cars it may fit just fine, and I'm sure that's what they did. They found a car. They built the system off of that particular car, but Ford had variances, as we've talked about before, between 16th and an eighth of an inch. Can be a problem. All right, so now what I'm going to talk about is center steer racks. Uh, there's a number of companies that do center steer racks with varying degrees of, <laughs> of success, in my opinion. I'm not going to say what's bad or what's good, but there are pluses to some systems that other systems don't have. Center steer rack is actually a pretty good idea because with a center steer rack, you can go in and mount your tie rod ends on a bar, mm -hmm. use a stock Mustang style tie rod to enter tie rod end on it, and then you have a good system. But the problem can come in that when it's a center steer rack, you have one plate in the center on the rack, and then the bar for the tie rod ends mounts to that. So what happens is, is when you're putting a lot of pressure on it and turns and stuff, especially with big tires on the car, you can have an issue of it starting to walk that center point and it starts to weaken the performance of the rack yeah. because you're you're using a lever that's moving that center point up and down because of the push of the inner, inner tie rods and the outer tie rod ends. So your alignment on the tie rods is much more important on that. Yeah, I mean you want the tie rods to be exactly yeah. where they need to be and that's an, an issue too. Now there is, uh, RRS offers a rack that has a, uh, a stabilizer bar, mm -hmm. which I like. I think yeah. if you're going to do a center steer rack, what RRS does is pretty dang smart, and it will help with the longevity of the rack. They also have their rack set up so that you can uh, raise and lower the bar itself yeah. for if you if you lower the car a good bit. Mm -hmm. um, so and just tuning it in for any chassis, really. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you have to make sure you put it in just right yeah. after you make the tuning on it, but you can tune that rack bar position up to get better bump steer out of the car. So I think that that kind of a system is always a good idea. If you're gonna look for a rack, that's the kind of rack I would personally look for is one that has a tunability yeah. to it for you know the position drop, if you will, of the car. Because no chassis is the same as the other. No, and I mean, <laughs> that's the other thing too. Now, there is a difference because a lot of the rack and pinion systems out there do the engine mount yep. position. Um, and. I don't say that that's a good thing or a bad thing. We, ju we just encountered some issues like we talked about just a second ago. Now the RRS system is the only one I know that's a little different in that it mounts to the positions for the steering box and the idler arm. And then they, they use locator bolts on the outside flange of the frame rail to keep everything from walking around too much. Gotcha. And all of them won't let you use column shift. <laughs> It, it doesn't matter what kind it is because you have to get from the steering box. You got to make a pretty extreme angle with the shaft. You're, you're probably going, like if this is your steering box, you're, you're kind of doing that. Yeah. Coming out of the steering box. You have a universal joint here, you have one here, and then you have the shaft going up to the steering column. And with that, typically you're cutting the column off either right flush with the firewall or you're going to have about that much sticking out, but it's not going to be enough yeah. to get the column shift to work. Yeah. And so almost every rack and pinion that's out there does not allow for column shift. Do you want to have a rack and pinion system with a column shift car? Cons on those racks, I guess it boils down to the, the column shift thing. I have heard the thing again with any rack and pinion, everybody always says, oh, you lose turn radius. That wasn't our experience when we yeah. put the, the steroids rack in the 67 Mustang hardtop. No, it turned just fine. Because we, we went out and did a turn radius thing before we put it in. We did another turn radius thing after we came back and put it in. And it was the same turn radius, and we didn't give anything up in that. And if I remember, the turns to lock was shorter as well. Yeah, it was a yeah. shorter turn to lock, but I mean, our, our lockout was still the same yeah. radius. The only thing we did have a problem on that unisteer was that we had to cut, I think, about three quarters of an inch off the tie rod, inner tie rod end, in order to get it to where you could actually get it to align yeah, correctly. Get the toe in, right? And that's been a problem for a long time on those. I've done two of those in one, a long time ago and one about four years ago, and they were still having the same problem with the inner tie rod ends. Rather have a longer one than a shorter one, though. 
I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> I'm not touching that. <laughs> um, not. And, well, I mean, yeah, because, you know, you can take some of it off of there. Yeah. But that boils down to what we talked about, too, is that's a stock-style inner tie rod in for something else. Yeah. And that's as close as they could get. Yep. So that's going to be kind of an issue. The one thing I like about um, like the TCP and RRS, both of those use a stock Mustang inner tie rod in for a manual steer. Okay. Um, and so that's a, a nice benefit yeah. on those type racks. I've seen some of the, the um, racks for the GM side of things. And again, I don't know that I would do that if it was me personally. I don't know that I would do that if I can get a nice Saginaw box that's going to be razor sharp. And it's, then it's a stock system, so replacement components are easy. The only advantage I can see is, like I said, if you just want that, that Porsche-like feel to your steering system where you're just basically, you can't really do too much on the wheel. Yeah, there's no, no need for rack and pinion. I, and, I don't and, personally see a need for it. If you can tell me why a rack and pinion is better on a 67 Camaro, Put in the comments below. I want to hear from you on that. Um, I really, I mean, that's basically it. Those are the three different types of systems that most people are using. So what's my bottom line? My bottom line is what are you doing with the car? Because uh, one like thing- Like we talk about- the, Yeah, the one top. thing I'd like to say with rack and pinion is even with manual steering, my 66 got squirrely at 60. The air going under the car picks the front end up and it was already very, very light front. Like the steering response was pretty sketchy. <laughs> now we did pick up some stuff because we used the streeter track system on that yes. car for the, for the uh, suspension. Mm -hmm. But it's still manual steering. I think it's the original steering box and you can easily just one finger lane change when you're doing highway speeds. But that also that, again, we're talking about you've made a change to the front end, you put mm -hmm. sticker, bigger, bigger tires on it, yeah. you've, you've changed the suspension, so you've zeroed out all those problems. Yeah. But now it's boiling down to, okay, well now I've got a problem I've got to deal with on the steering system. Yeah, and at, at that point, I wouldn't want a more responsive steering system. <laughs> <laughs> you might, would. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how to go on that. Yeah. So my opinion is this, sometimes you're stuck like with our 69 Fairlane wagon. I don't want to put a floor shifter in it. Yeah. So we're stuck trying to make slave cylinder work. Make the slave cylinder work along with all the problems that go with that of it busting the, the mounting bracket loose about every two or three mm -hmm. weeks. Um, us still trying to weld it in there and make it work, which that hasn't worked very well either. Hydraulic lines hanging down. And that's another problem with the stock slave cylinder stuff on the Ford side of yep. things. You know, the Saginaw boxes, you don't have that issue at all, but on the Ford side you do. Um, sometimes you're just stuck. Yep. Sometimes you don't have an option for a better option. Right. If I had a, an option for a better option, it's going to really depend. Um, if I were doing, let's say we were doing uh, the 67 Mustang hardtop that we've got in, my buddy's car. If we did an aftermarket suspension on that, I might would want to go with a rack mm -hmm. to tie in with that better handling yeah. suspension. If the suspension can take the, the actual performance of a rack, then it's definitely worth a rack. I think that might even be an option on your car to go in and put a rack and pinion system on there. Or maybe what we should do with yours is do the experiment of what can we do to the stock mm -hmm. box system. That's yeah, a, what a great video after yeah. I get my bloody wing fixed. <laughs> First I gotta put an engine in it. <laughs> Unless we want to push it around the yard. <laughs> it's, it we feels enough, better. We can roll it down the hill. <laughs> We've got the test driveway now. We can roll it down the hill. Um, I guess that's really it. My opinion is it's what you want to do, but I think that you just have to weigh what you want. Do yeah. you want the rack and pinion, that precision, or are you okay with a stock steering system on the car? Um, or is a Borgeson box a good idea for you where you want that, you want to have that nice feel to the car, but you want a stock feel and you yet want to have a good, solid, reliable power steering system. What do you want to do? And that's really the boil down on anything we do out here. So, I guess that's it then. Do me a favor, go out and check out our Patreon account. At the $10 a month level, you get monthly meetings with me on Zoom with a bunch of other people. We do tech Q&A and all that. We also are trying to get done videos every month that are special tech videos for the guys on the Patreon group. If you're on here on YouTube, don't worry. It doesn't affect anything we do on here. Andrew is being put to work doing those, so that's his problem. So if you're not getting your Patreon videos, blame Andrew. You need to make him an email. 
<laughs> we'll put you, next week we'll have Andrew's email that you can put on here for your Patreon member and talk to him about how much he <laughs> sucks for not getting videos done. But it's actually... If you're a Patreon me member, you can message him. <laughs> Give him a text message. <laughs> yeah, message rates apply. <laughs> also, subscribe to the channel. Uh, we want you to subscribe to the channel. If you're enjoying the content you see here with us, Subscription is the best way to find us on a, on a weekly basis. We post videos usually on Sundays and Thursdays unless my computer dies like it has repeatedly for the last couple of weeks. Um, we've just had all kind of stuff. It's been rough. It's been rough. The <laughs> building and all that. We'll talk about the building after we get through with this section. But subscribe to the channel. Click the bell for notifications if you want the notifications. And it'll put something in your friendly little email box to let you know what's going on. Finally, folks, do me the favor of being kind to each other, love on each other, like each other. You guys have a great week, and we'll see you next time on Auto Resto Mod. So, the building. Mm -hmm. The building. <laughs> it's here. Insulation sitting in the back of the truck. Got a little Carolina squat going on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just I can't help that. Hey, they're making it illegal in a few states, so we're winning. We're winning. It's someday that it won't be allowed. Um, we're waiting on garage doors. We don't have our garage doors yet, and we are waiting for electricity because apparently now by code, and it's a national code, you have to have some sort of cutoff box that only one company is making. And guess what? For some reason, there's about a six to eight week delay. If you know of a good way to get around this and beat that code, please be my friend. Send me an email at the email address below and we'll do that because I'm tired of this thing sitting here with 110 power in this building, no compressors, having to run a bloody generator to do MIG welding. <laughs> I know, way. Eh? Live in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Just chuck all this stuff. I don't, do survival I don't need no government man telling me how to build a building. <laughs> yeah, I should have been out in the sticks with you. <laughs> we have good internet now. I have great internet. I like where I'm at. I just, I like what we've done with the place. Mm -hmm. I just really yeah. want... 45 minutes to any part store is not fun. No, and that's the problem with living out in the nowhere. Too. Yes. All right, folks. Well, anyway, that's our little spiel of on and talking about crap that some of you have already signed off on, and that's okay. But you guys that stick to the very end... You're the cool ones. You're the cool ones. Oh, you're the cool ones. And, and you're <laughs> you're the, the cool, cool ones. ones. You guys will see you later. <laughs> this is stupid. Yeah. <laughs>